Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Thursday Bible Life today. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 11 this morning. So get your Bibles and turn there and uh, follow along as I begin to read in a little bit. It may be a little bit tedious and dry going through this because it is basically a tremendous world history lesson. And this particular chapter is one of the reasons that Bible critics uh, kind of criticize the Bible and don't want to believe it because of its great accuracy. Because what happens in this chapter that's revealed to Daniel in the way of prophecy has now become history. And we discover that it was so accurate that Bible critics say that it had to have been written by somebody much later than Daniel and somebody other than Daniel because of its accuracy, because they cannot accept the fact of a miracle that a God, uh, through an angel that we anticipate was Gabriel, gave such uh, precise prophecy to Daniel to be recorded ahead of time. This chapter then will detail a long uh, period of time and the information between the Testaments, between the time of the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the coming of John the Baptist, who the Lord said was the last and greatest of the prophets of the Old Testament time. And uh, so the details will talk about the three remaining Gentile world empires represented by the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream. There were four empires in that image that he saw. And we remember now that the first one image of himself, that head of gold represented the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon's now come to a close of its reign and we're entering into the time when the Medo-Persian Empire comes into play. And after that will be the empire of Greece, Alexander the Great, and after that will be the Roman Empire. And so this particular chapter will deal quite a bit in the struggles between the Persians and the Greeks and then also, after the death of Alexander the Great, the inner turmoil between the four generals who took over the kingdom of Greece and then fought amongst themselves. And finally, we're kind of uh, throttled a little bit uh, by the upcoming Roman Empire as we get towards the end of the chapter. This little horn that you may recall that we saw and talked about in chapter 7 and 8 will show up again today in this chapter in the person of Antiochus Epiphanes. And he will be the one that will end up at the end of the chapter desecrating the temple and uh, killing many people in the land of Israel and will end up uh, being uh, defeated in battle by the Maccabees, which will result in what we know as the Feast of Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication when the, after the Maccabean revolt succeeded in defeating the Antiochus Epiphanes Syrian army they rededicated and cleansed the temple. And uh, on the 25th of Kislev, which is close to the time of our December 25th on our Gregorian calendar. So that's why we have Hanukkah very close to the time of Christmas each year. And so uh, this particular chapter has relevance to us for several reasons. One is the prophecy that was given to Daniel and majority of it has now become history. It was so accurate that it gives us faith to believe that the rest of what we read in the Bible will also be very accurate. It also fills in the gap between the Testaments. And it talks about these times of the Gentiles that last from the time of Daniel to the day in which you and I live and beyond our day into what I believe will be only the near future when the Antichrist will come at the end of the age and then the coming and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to the, be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to set up his kingdom and rule over the house of Jacob forever. So there's great relevance uh, to our day as was to the day of Daniel and to the day in which the Lord had his earthly ministry and is relevant out into the future ahead of our day. But it doesn't take away from the fact that some of this historical reading that we're going to be considering this morning gets a little bit difficult or tedious. So there are still prophetical events to take place. And uh, we'll recognize when we 
get to the line of demarcation towards the end of the chapter between history and prophecy. But remember, it was all prophecy when Daniel first wrote it. Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 11, verse number 1. I'll just read through these verses and then share comments that various Bible scholars have given about these particular verses. Verse 1, also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. In other words, <clears throat> what we believe or who we believe to have been Gabriel, the angel that was sent to give Daniel the understanding of this vision he had. And remember this vision covers chapters 10, 11, and 12. And Gabriel was detained by the prince of Persia when he was first sent from God's presence to see Daniel and give him this information. And then Michael the archangel came to help him. We talked about that last week in chapter 10 when we looked at uh, a little bit of an insight into the dark side, into the spiritual warfare that goes on in dimensions of the universe that you and I uh, normally are not aware of and cannot see into. But he's saying here that uh, he assisted Darius. Remember, he was that first king of the Medo-Persian Empire that allowed the captives of Israel to go back to their country. So verse 2, now I'll tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up against all the realm of Greece. And uh, secular history has shown that these uh, three and then a fourth king of the kingdom of Persia were probably Antiochus Epiphanes and uh, three more kings, the fourth, uh, Cambyses, Pseudos Myrtus, and Darius Hestepses, and then Xerxes, which I believe is the same guy that's referred to as Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. Verse 3, Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And this is and, uh, Alexander the Great, and the coming of the Grecian Empire. And when he is arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not a, among his prosperity or posterity, posterity, <laughs> his descendants, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others beside these. Remember that Alexander the Great had no descendants to leave his kingdom to, and so the kingdom was divided up between four generals. Uh, two of them, Cassander and Lysimachus, kind of faded out into the night, but the other two became quite powerful and even had wars between them, which will be a great portion of this chapter. And uh, one was on the north side of Israel, Syria, and those were the Seleucids, and then the other was to the south of Israel, the Ptolemies down in Egypt. And when they war back and forth between one another, it seems like uh, the Jewish people and the nation and land of Israel uh, get uh, bumped on the head every time that happens. Verse 5, Also the king of the south shall become strong as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. So we see the beginning of this clash between the north and the south between the Ptolemies in the south and between uh, the Seleucids in the north around Syria. At the end of some years, they shall join forces for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of her authority and neither he nor his authority shall stand, but she shall be given up and with those who brought her and with him who begot her and with him who strengthened her in these times. What we find out here and we see is a politically arranged marriage between the daughter of one of the Ptolemies in the south to one of the kings of the Seleucids in the north. And what we find in secular history is that this daughter named Berenice was given uh, by Ptolemy Philadelphus to marry Sirius King Antiochus II Theos. And to do that, he divorced his original wife to marry Bernice and the king in the south, the Ptolemy, thought that that would gain an advantage for him. But what we find out from history is that that divorced wife of Antiochus in her 
envy and rage killed Bernice and her son and then ended up, up poisoning uh, her former husband and set her own son up on the throne whose uh, name was uh, Seleucus, Seleucus II Callinicus. And so we see that there's a tremendous drama taking place here in these political arranged marriages and all this uh, deceiving back and forth and the plotting and so forth. <clears throat> Verse 7 says, But from a branch of her roots one shall arise in his place, who shall come with an army, enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail. And we find that this re has reference to the fact that Bernice's brother uh, then gained the throne in Egypt and then came and defeated that northern Syrian army, and he took back a lot of the treasure. He shall also carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold and he shall continue for more years than the king of the north. Also the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the south, but shall return to his own land. So back and forth they try to do battle, and they defeat one another and so forth. However, his son shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress and shall stir up strife. So the sons and the uh, succession of the Seleucid kings in the north continue this uh, war against the kings in the south down in Egypt and Israel's caught in the, in the land in between them. And the king of the south shall be moved with rage and go out and fight with him and the king of the north who shall muster a great multitude but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. When he's taken away the multitude his heart will be lifted up and he will cast down tens of thousands but he shall not prevail. For the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. So years later, another Antiochus on the throne in Syria will come and have a greater army, and will be able to, for a period of time, uh, show a little bit of defeat over the uh, Ptolemies in Egypt. Now in those times, many will rise up against the king of the south, also violent men, and your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. So as Gabriel's given this information to Daniel, he says that your people, that would be the Jewish people that are caught in between the, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, they're going to try to pick one side or the other, and it seems like, unfortunately for them, they always choose the wrong side at the time, and so many of them will suffer and die in the midst of the, all of that. Verse 16, But he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. And I believe the glorious land there refers to the land of Egypt, uh, Israel. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it. But he shall not stand with him or be with him. We see another arranged political marriage. This time it's a daughter from the north being given to a king of the south. So we find out that uh, Antiochus was pressured by Rome, this upstart fourth world empire that's just now beginning to come on the scene, wanted to not have a world war between these two Grecian factions. And so they begin to show a little of their strength and keep the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom from annihilating one another. So Antiochus in the north decided that he would give his daughter to marry one of the Ptolemies in the south. That daughter's name was Cleopatra. But to the chagrin of the Seleucid king or the Antiochus uh, in the north, Cleopatra showed uh, devotion to her husband rather than to her dad. So his plans didn't work out like he wanted. After this, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall take many, but a ruler shall bring the reproach against him to an end, and with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. In other words, at that time, the northern king was trying to take over some of the islands of Greece, and this upstart Roman government kept him from doing that. Then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but with a few days, within a few days, he shall be destroyed. 
and not in anger or in battle. So one of these northern kings is going to try to tax the people to pay the tribute money that's now been required of him from this upstart Roman government. In his place shall arise a vile person. And this is the entrance on the scene of Antiochus Epiphanes. They will not give honor to him or royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. This is how this uh, little horn that we saw in chapter 7 and 8 represent Antiochus Epiphanes and how Antiochus Epiphanes then is a typology of the Antichrist that will come one of these days with intrigue and deceiving people. Then with the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken and also the prince of the covenant. So he's going to even be involved in some political and religious affairs in the glorious land, the people of the covenant, the Jewish people. And he even uh, gets one of the high priests there to be murdered uh, because he made a, a league with that high priest's brother, Menelaus, killed his brother, Onias III. And so we see that Israel's getting involved in all of this uh, to do. After the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come and become strong with a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them plunder and spoil and riches, and shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a short time. He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great army of his own. But he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. So Antiochus has a great army. He comes against the army of the Ptolemies in the south, and we find out that there are uh, uh, traitors uh, to the Ptolemies in the south, and so it looks like Antiochus Epiphanes is going to gain the upper hand and may have completely annihilated them. But we see that the Roman government upstart people will come in and uh, stop that again. But these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil. They shall speak lies at the same table. In other words, the kings of the north, the kings of the south, are going to try to come to a peace treaty at the table and they end up lying to one another. That wouldn't happen today, would it? <laughs> I think it happens all the time. Uh, even in the time in which you and I live. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. We see now the time in history in which Antiochus Epiphanes was kept back from what we're going to see as Roman ships from Cyprus coming to stop him down in verse 30. It says, For ships from Cyprus shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant, and do damage, so he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. He's stopped by Roman ships that come from Cyprus to keep him from completely annihilating Egypt and the Ptolemies in the south. And in his anger, as he is forced to go back home to Syria, he stops on the way and just completely annihilates many people in Israel and desecrates the temple. This is the time when uh, the abomination of desolation uh, took place that uh, the Lord himself talked about referring to Daniel's prophecy from Daniel chapter 9. We talked about that. And that particular abomination of desolation was given as a prophecy and it will resemble what Antiochus Epiphanes did around 167 or 68 B.C., after that, this Antiochus Epiphanes killed many people, stopped the practice of Judaism and the sacrificial offerings and so forth, would not even let the Jewish people uh, circumcise their children and so forth, and threatened them and killed many thousands of them and desecrated the temple. It brought about the Maccabean revolt. And Judas Maccabeus, the hammer, after three years of guerrilla warfare, defeated the Syrian army, and they rededicated the temple and cleansed it. And that brought about the festival or the de of dedication or the feast of dedication that we know today as Hanukkah or the Feast of Lights or the Feast of Dedication, as John called it in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, 
that Jesus observed when he was here in his earthly ministry. So there's some history there that we're a little bit familiar with and so forth. So verse 32, those who do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt with flattery, but the people who know God uh, shall be strong. And I believe that refers to the Maccabees and the revolt that they led. And those people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. So they, there was great loss of people that uh, remained loyal to the Maccabees and to God and uh, wanting to maintain uh, their uh, way of living under the Mosaic law and practicing Judaism. And uh, says that they will be uh, aided with a little help but many shall join them in the intrigue and some of those who have understanding shall fall uh, to refine them and purify them and make them white until the time of the end because it is still for an appointed time. And here between verse 35 and 36 is where we have this line of demarcation between it was all prophecy when Daniel wrote it, but everything that we've read up to this point has been fulfilled. So for you and me, it has it's history. But then when we come to verse 36, it's going to be talking about things out into the future and it will still be prophetic. So at verse 36, we have this line separating historical events in this chapter from prophetical events. Verse 36 says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. This is where this reference to what is written here in this portion of Daniel chapter 11, I believe is referring to the Antichrist who will come on the scene sometime out into the near future from the day in which you and I live. Verse 37 says, He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. Some people think that the Antichrist may have homosexual tendencies here where it says he didn't regard the desire of women. But some Bible scholars believe that the desire of women in that day was for a Jewish woman to give birth to the coming prophesied and promised Messiah. And he would be against the Messiah because he wants to be worshipped himself as he will be uh, possessed by Satan and want the world to uh, worship him. And uh, so there's a little bit of a difference of opinion about that. Verse 38 says, But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortress with a foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance his glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. So he's going to divide the land, and when it speaks of the land there, I think it probably is in reference to the, the holy land, the promised land. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. So out into the future, when the Antichrist has set up his world empire and kingdom, he's going to find opposition, both from the north and from the south. People will try to fight against him. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through. So the people that try to come against this Antichrist will be defeated by him. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. So the Antichrist will enter into the land of Israel. But those shall escape from his hand, Edom and Moab and the prominent people of Ammon. There will be certain areas of uh, geographic areas that are mentioned here that will uh, temporarily uh, get out from under the rule of the Antichrist. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also, the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. Verse 44, But news from the east and from the north shall trouble him. 
Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and to annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his place or palace between the seas. That, I believe, is between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea in the land of the Promised Land. Between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, which would have reference to Zion in Jerusalem. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. What we find and what we will look at next week in chapter 12 is that the uh, plan that God has for the Lord to return and to set up his kingdom. Sorry about that. We went a little long in this history lesson, didn't we? And I didn't get finished before the clocks had started to do their thing. <laughs> but next week we'll be in chapter 12 and we'll see the end of this particular vision and the end of the book of Daniel. And it references a time that leaps beyond the day in which you and I live out into the future during the time of the Antichrist and a world empire, a one world government, a one world religion that will be put down and defeated when the Lord returns. And isn't it amazing that seems like many of the countries in the world today, especially in the last several months, have been pushing for globalism and a global government and people being in charge over all of the world under a centralized government or leader, which I believe fits very well into the prophetical passages that we find in Scripture that talk about the Antichrist who will one day soon come upon the scene and be uh, trying to rule the world against, the, uh, against God's word, but in reality will fulfill God's word, and then the Lord himself will defeat him when he returns. So we're living in biblical times. A lot of times we have an idea that biblical times refer to only the times that are written about in the Bible. But I believe that you and I are living in some of the greatest biblical times that this book references. And we'll begin to see how that pans out in the near future, I think. Father, thank you for today and for the blessings you've given. Thank you for your word. We're reminded today of the great accuracy. There are no errors in your word. You pre-recorded history before it happened to such an exact uh, thing that Bible critics do not accept it as coming at the time that Daniel wrote it and try to say that it had to have been written afterwards because of its great accuracy. So because of that, Father, we gain faith to believe that every other thing that you've told us in your word will be just as accurate and will be fulfilled literally just as you have told us. We do so look forward to the hopefully soon coming return of the Lord Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. Until then, Father, help us that we might serve you in a manner that's pleasing to you, that we might be found faithful. Thank you for those who join us online. We ask your continued blessings upon them, for your mercy upon our country, and especially upon the land and the people of Israel. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Well, hope you have a great week and weekend, and we'll see you next week. Lord bless you.